Welcome to another Numismatic Notes with Benjamin. I'm uh, trying to get a couple of videos done this week because I will be leaving for the Bahamas on Friday. And it'll be about eight days or so before I can get back and have another video made. So I figured one today, maybe one by Thursday, and you guys will be able to not have me <laughs> on your feed with new videos for about a week or so. The note I'm sharing with you today is a one pound Egyptian bank note. It measures 160 by 80 millimeters and it was printed by the Central Bank of Egypt. The predominant colors on it are brown, green, purple, looks like a little bit of blue in there, some orange. The standard catalog of world paper money calls this a pick 44 and the bank notebook calls this B310. I also used Wikipedia as a source for some of the more esoteric information about this bank note, but I also am using my own experience having visited Egypt um, within the last 10 years. This particular note is a uh, pick 44 um, B because it is signed by Ahmed Zindo. And I may be wrong about whether it's A or B, but I'm not wrong about it being signed by Ahmed Zindo. We're looking at the face of the note here, and you can see the Arabic text that identifies the nation, the bank, the denomination, and the date. Um, what we see is the mosque and mausoleum of Sultan Kate Bey at the Mamluk Cemetery in Cairo. I want to apologize in advance for any inadvertent butchering of names that are in a language that I honestly don't speak. You can't see it, but here to the uh, left in the watermark uh, box is the scribe, which is president, presently the focus of the current 200-pound banknote. The intricate, the intricate design and lathe work you can see here in the background in the central and along the top, along the bottom, over here on the side, uh, you can sometimes see the flowers and the arabesque up here at the top. It's a very beautifully well-designed banknote for a low, a low value. Um, this particular mosque and mausoleum is found in the Mamluk Cemetery, which um, also goes by the name of the City of the Dead. And because of urbanization and housing issues, many people are actually now living in the cemetery. Originally, this was true because the cemeteries um, required caretakers and people to live there and maintain the tombs. Now it's just because it's one of the cheaper places in the city to live. Because of um, squatting, the number of people who are actually living in the, the City of the Dead may be exaggerating depending on who is providing the numbers. It's in the best interest of some of the people who provide numbers to say that very few people live there. And it's in the best interest of other people to say that a great many people are living in the cemetery nowadays. Um, the cemetery in Arabic is called Al-Karafa, which is a toponym of the Banu Karafa ibn Guzan ibn Wali clan, who once owned land nearby and gave their name to the cemetery. This uh, building is actually part of the funerary complex of the Sultan Cape Bay, and it was completed in 1474. Um, the whole complex is not remaining standing, but this big portion of it is. It is considered to be the most beautiful of the Mamluk constructs. Not all of the construction remains, as I said. Only left is the mosque, his mausoleum, a smaller mosque, and a smaller mausoleum for his sons. There is a hod, which is a historic drinking trough uh, to water animals, and there is a rob, which is a rentable apartment complex. One can still appreciate, on this note, the oblock stonework. And for those of you not in the know... And that includes me. I was not in the know until last night whenever I researched and found this piece. The light stone and then the dark stone stripes of the construction um, work together and are called a block stonework. I like it. I think that style is absolutely beautiful. Now let's take a second and let's take a look at the back of this beautiful Egyptian bank note. Let me reshift the photography. What we have here are, to the far left, are two 
statues of Ramesses II from the Great Temple at Abu Simbel. You also see uh, above the bas-relief and standing statues of Hathor, Nefertari, Ramses II from the smaller temple at Abu Simbel. Um, Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great, ruled Egypt from 1279 until 1213 BC. He was the third pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Uh, you can still see his mummy in the museum uh, in the capital. So I imagine when they open the great new museum, you will still be able to see his mummy. Oh my. You talk about mummies and your whole desk acts cursed. Give me a second to get that fixed. <laughs> Whew. I'll be very gentle when I speak about the mummy of Ramses again. Now, um, Abu Simbel, which gives its name to these two temples, is actually a small village in the Egyptian part of Nubia, very close to the border with the Sudan, and it has a population of about 2,600. Um, it is a very hot place. It is a very dry place. They absolutely have no rainy season there, but it is on the shore of some of the coolest looking water I have ever seen. The vivid blue certainly contrasts with the arid uh, landscape in which the lake finds itself in. Uh, lake Nasser, which is what the body of water uh, that was not historically there, but has come to be because uh, they've dammed the Nile, um, has covered the hard to navigate first and second cataracts of the Nile. The entire area depends on tourism as there is a lot of sand, there is a lot of water, but there is hardly any land that is farm worthy. This uh, area is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In 1968, due to imminent flooding um, of the, of the, by the dam of that area of, oh, I guess you'd call it Upper Egypt, the two temples were completely dismantled and raised so as not to be subjured. To, to be, uh, they were completely raised so as not to be submerged by the rising lake waters. At a cost of approximately 300 million in today dollars, they were able to move these two temples up 65 meters and then back 200 meters from the new water line. This great temple is dedicated to Amun, Raharakati, and Ptah, as well as Ramses II. The smaller temple um, is. Um, dedicated to Hathor, who is personified uh, by Ramesses II's favorite wife, Nefertari. Now, I have a couple of thoughts on the City of the Dead. This was one of the few things in Egypt I didn't actually get to visit whenever I was in Egypt. There's literally months of time that you could take in Egypt to go and see everything. And this is not one of the things I saw. I'll be honest, going and visiting a cemetery in a foreign country is about as exciting to me as visiting a cemetery in my own country. It's not something I want to do. It was very impressive when we were on uh, the Ring Road, driving through the, the Cairo and the miles and miles and miles of the cemetery that existed in the hot and dry heat. It was not something I wanted to do. Instead of going to the City of the Dead, we actually went to the Cairo City Dump, which is an amazing example of recycling and has got to be the worst smelling place I have ever visited in my life. But smack dab in the middle of that dump is a church that was built right there in the middle of the dump. And some of the richest people you find in Cairo are those who live in the dump and recycle. Uh, that being said, I almost wished I had visited the City of the Dead that day in Cairo. Later on in our visit, we were able to um, travel to Abu Simbel. We flew by airplane, and when we got to the airport, and I discovered it was just another $300 to go to Abu Simbel, I looked at my heart, and I looked at my face in the window, and I looked at the mirror in the re restroom, and I thought, I am so close to Abu Simbel that it only costs $300 to go this last little bit. I'm stupid if I don't go. So I went, and that is why all these years later, I'm still paying off my Egyptian trip. But we got on a lovely cool plane where they gave us juice, and we got to settle back for 
oh, I think it was a, it may have been a one hour flight up north or up down south rather to um, Abu Simbel. We got off the plane at a very modern airport, smack dab in the middle of nothing but sand. And by the time we walked over and were in Abu Simbel proper, for some reason, we were the only group, maybe because it was the end of May, 1st of June, and it was just so hot it was unbelievable. I gladly paid $3 for a, I think, a 15-ounce bottle of Coke. I'm not exactly sure how big it was, but I realized by the time my day was over that I needed about $10 worth of Coke if I was ever going to go back to Abu Simbel. There were so few people there, actually, that when we... <laughs> When we arrived at these temples, uh, one of the gentlemen in robes who was there had to unlock the door to let us in. And I'll never forget, he pulled a key out of his pocket. And I'm not kidding you, it was a key of life. It was a Egyptian key of life. And it was huge. It was about a foot long key. He opened the door and let us in. And folks, it was truly amazing. Um, those feet of the Pharaoh are huge. How do I know this? There's a big sign and a chain around the base that says no tourists pass this point. So of course, with a little bit of money, the security guard um, held the chain down so we could step over it and in fact sit and touch Ramsey's big toe. And it was a big toe. More fascinating for me though was actually getting inside and out of that sun. It, it's very cool in the shade when it's extremely hot outside, especially in Egypt, and especially when you're right next to a great big body of water. For some reason, it was just a delightful place to spend an afternoon. The artwork, the carvings, the statuary in both of the temples were definitely something to be appreciated, and I'm so glad I had the chance to be there and experience that. One of the things I really appreciate, and that I never would have appreciated unless I had actually been in e these Egyptian temples. Um, as a Christian, um, in the Old Testament, which is also the Jewish Bible, you have so many things about the habitat of God, the abode of the Lord, the temple, the tabernacle, um, the Holy of Holies. And you realize that even though um, this is Egyptian and not necessarily the Jewish temple, there is a pattern in how these holy places were built. There were holies of holies, there were outer courtyards, there were inner courtyards. And what was fascinating for me is that on one day of the year, according to our tour guide, the sun would shine right into the middle of Ramses II's temple, and it would lighten up three of the four statues that were there in the middle. And the statue that was never lit up was the statue of Set, who I believe was a dark god, you know, one who wasn't, you know, keen on being exposed to the light. And um, I may be wrong about which god that was, but for me it was fascinating to hear that story. And uh, when they ended up moving these two temples up and out of the water, it was said that the day where the sun shone into the Holy of Holies of these temple um, was a day later. Originally, legend has it that the two days of the year that the sun shines into the middle of the temple was the day that was Ramsey's birth and the day that was Ramsey's death. Um, I think it's a great story. I'm not really clear how Ramsey's was able to predict his own death as the, you know, as you know, they say it was, but it certainly makes for tourists going, Oh, Ooh, ah, taking pictures and paying, paying some, uh, you know, money to the guard to look the other way while they go and stand on Ramsey's big toe. <laughs> um, if you ever get a chance to go to Egypt, I strongly recommend that you spend the extra $300 and fly down to or up to Abu Simbel, uh, whatever your orientation is, and enjoy the day and the modern facilities they have there for you and the really pricey Coca-Colas that help make that desert bearable. Um, anybody who collects things that are Egyptian, uh, statues, royalty, hats, wall carvings, wall paintings, things that are sandy, uh, $3 Cokes, airplanes that take you to the backwoods of a nation, and, um, 
amazing places that are UNESCO World Heritage Sites would want to have this banknote for their collection. I um, was able to buy this note for not very much money, and I believe they're easily available on the market. If you like the video, please click like, please share it, and for goodness sakes, please subscribe so that you can be notified of fresh content as I upload it. Click on the purple circle and share with your friends. Um, my or share with your friends my YouTube channel, Numismatic Notes with Benjamin. I am Benjamin, and I hope that you have a jewel of a day.